I'm going to talk about the global hygiene economy. Um, I'm Dr. Michaela Kendall. I'm CEO of Adelan. We are the longest running fuel cell technology business in the UK. And we invent, um, patent, license, manufacture and sell fuel cells, which is a key part of the hygiene economy. Just a little bit about Adelan. We've been 25 years pioneering the hygiene economy. So we were established in 1996. We're based in Birmingham in, in the UK and um, it's the heart of the advanced manufacturing area and also the automotive sector. So we started making fuel cells in 1996, started building systems, um, focusing on uh, more on the combined heat and power market, but quickly moved on to um, auxiliary power units in uh, drones and vehicles. And we've been part of lots of different activities related to hydrogen throughout those 25 years. So at the moment, I'm the hydrogen uh, champion for mission innovation, which is an international uh, technology and innovation program. And I speak regularly to Bayes. I'm the chair of the Midlands Fuel Cell and Hydrogen Network, which is around 250 organizations that are working in fuel cells and hydrogen to, um, to propel the technology in the UK, but also internationally. I'm a member of the Department for Transport Net Zero Board uh, for Transport, and also the Midlands Engine Hydrogen Technologies Leadership Team and the Business Council. And I'm working with the West Midlands Combined Authority and the LEP. So we're trying to um, put fuel cells and hydrogen into the Commonwealth Games, which is coming to Birmingham next year, and also leading um, on the COP26 hydrogen um, activities, as well as putting a fuel cell for the first time on the HS2 project, which is the um, high-speed train project in the UK, which is one of the largest European um, infrastructure projects. So 20 years ago, one of our co-founders founded the EPSERC Fuel Cell Centre at the University of Birmingham. So it's, it's good to see that mentioned. And also I was involved in the industrial uh, decarbonisation challenge, uh, writing that about three years ago. So we've been investing into fuel cells and, and hydrogen into those core technologies and building market knowledge for 25 years. And we've built substantial IP in that area. And we continue to build products. We really explore those early markets of fuel cells and um, sales of uh, units and also of hydrogen fuel. And we've seen a massive recent market growth. And that's really driven by climate change most recently, but over the 25 years, air quality and energy security, which have also been mentioned today, were key drivers. So hydrogen today is a global mega trend, and we've seen this massive market acceleration recently, and it's driven by many of the factors that, that people have discussed already, but I'd like to go through them because they're so compelling and they make the case for hydrogen and for fuel cell and electrolyzer technologies extremely compelling. So first of all, the climate change target, 75 countries and more have um, built in net zero carbon ambitions uh, into their policies. In the UK, net zero is law by 2050. There are national hydrogen strategies. I'm involved with many of them around the world, Europe, China, the US, very ambitious hydrogen strategies to uh, develop hydrogen supply of the fuel and also of the fuel cells and electrolyzers. There are vehicle bans for internal combustion engines. Over 20 countries have announced sales bans on those vehicles, hinging around the time 2030 to 2035. And more and more private sector organizations, so businesses, have committed to science-based greenhouse gas um, emission reduction targets. And that's up year on year. So it was tripled last year compared to 2019. Renewable energy prices are, are dropping. They're expected to drop by 15% further between uh, 2020 and 2030. And the value chain, something that Jürgen just re referred to, which is so key, they are accelerating the system cost declines. And it's really important to understand that there is nothing fundamentally expensive about fuel cells and electrolyzers. It's just when you build them by hand, uh, by, uh, they're hand built by uh, PhD trained scientists, they're going to be expensive. And when you mass produce them, 
they they really really drop in price. Ballard quotes a figure of 90% cost reduction, and we find something similar in our systems. So hydrogen production costs, of course, decline as well then when you get the hardware right and you get the cost structures of the hardware right. And we're looking at a, a target of around $2 per kilogram um, by 2030 for hydrogen. And then we're just starting because the increase of hydrogen production is now projected, then we're starting to look at the storage and real distribution of hydrogen globally. And so what this means is this massive market acceleration in, in um, this sector and over 50 gigawatts of green hydrogen electrolysis projects were announced just in 2020 and, and let's face it 2020 was a reasonably quiet year for businesses. So if you look at the geography of the value chain, so this is hydrogen technology investments across the world, you can see that every region is investing in hydrogen. Uh, the US has always been strong in hydrogen, particularly California in, for transport, but China has committed $20 billion by 2023, and Europe has a, lots and lots of, um, especially transport, but lots of other programs on fuel cells and hydrogen. Um, Adelan co-wrote the foundation documents for a very important program that ran, um, is still running um, hydrogen and fuel cell projects. That's the uh, fuel cell and hydrogen joint undertaking, a 2 billion euro commitment uh, from Europe in the mid noughties. And that's continuing, but actually increasing. So you can see there's a massive commitment. So if we look at just one small city in China, uh, a city that we've worked in, in Foshan, the numbers of vehicles this, uh, well, last year, is now in excess of over a thousand vehicles in a, a city of about two million people. And in fact, that one city exceeds the entire vehicle population, hydrogen vehicle population of Europe. So China is really committing to hydrogen and fuel cells, partly because of the electrified platforms that they've produced. So if we look at the hydrogen opportunities, then you can look, um, that, so the top right of this, this image from the Hydrogen Council is where uh, you want to be looking. Then heavy duty trucks is one of the biggest um, opportunities for hydrogen. So in a nutshell, this graph shows, and you can refer to it online, uh, there are nine applications that are expected to be cost competitive conventional technologies by 2030. So some of them are already competitive and it's, and it's important to understand that um, fuel cells, actually some fuel cells can use not just hydrogen, but other hydrocarbon fuels as well. So there are some cost competitive technologies today, but by 2030, we expect those, um, those applications to be strongly competitive. And actually there are 13 applications where hydrogen is the best choice to decarbonize for different reasons. So things like steel, uh, combined cycle turbines, these are all different um, spaces outside of transport. But if you look at the different transport opportunities for hydrogen, they're vast. Uh, they, they've started with passenger cars and especially in captive fleets like taxi fleets, this is very common in China, uh, but also buses, um, that's very common in Europe and globally actually. And increasingly there's an opportunity for the heavy goods vehicles uh, for those long range uh, transport applications. Logistics vehicles, also a lot of take up there. And also with um, uh, forklift trucks, there's a po vehicle population of over 30,000 in the US. There is uh, the hydrogen train in, um, in Germany. So rail is absolutely looking at hydrogen and in non-electrified lines, hydrogen is extremely cost competitive and actually beats diesel as well as electrification in terms of costs. If you look at airplanes and drones, of course, there's an ambition and an appetite for hydrogen to propel planes. And there are many programs looking at it. But marine is also a very huge opportunity to reduce, to decarbonize. So there are obviously lots of other applications aside from uh, transport, like portable goods for recharging. And it's also important to recognize that there's a shift away from centralized power generation and even fuel generation to uh, distributed networks. So if we look across the world at the different investments that are going into hydrogen, it's incredibly impressive. 
Europe is, is, is really committing. Um, sorry, you can't quite see that. I hope you can see it if the slides get sent round. But they're, they're committing up to 470 billion towards hydrogen. And th there are similar, um, smaller sized uh, commitments from individual European countries. And um, the US is at the moment establishing its very ambitious hydrogen strategy and, and working through the different options. But individually, there are many countries. Chile has been mentioned today. Australia is, has a firm commitment to hydrogen, especially being generated by solar. Um, China, I've already mentioned. Korea. Um, yesterday, I was talking about a project which was um, of the order of 1.8 billion um, for just for six, six sites. So there are enormous um, investments in, in place. And there is some differentiation by geography of what people are doing in terms of the technology and then of course the applications that that technology is going into so it's really important to understand that this is a very very active global network primarily of technologists and technology businesses but also there is a strong market need now to decarbonize which over the 30 years that I've worked in hydrogen, I've seen a couple of waves of enthusiasm for hydrogen and fuel cells, but I, I don't see this one going away. I think this one is incredibly uh, persistent because the, the problem of climate change needs to be addressed and there are really quite limited options. So I think there is a real need at the moment for an internationally coordinated program on hydrogen and fuel, cell, fuel cells. And, Indeed, the UK has a unique role in that we are one of the earliest fuel cell companies established in the world. And, and there really was a, a strong appetite early on for fuel cells and hydrogen. Um, people may find it familiar that the, uh, the, the technologies have not been particularly invested in or commercialized, and, that, and that's a, a common problem in the UK. But I think that can be addressed very, very easily with investment. And, and that needs to be targeted in a way that, that allows businesses, as Jürgen said, to focus on how they scale up these technologies to deliver both the technologies and the hydrogen fuel into that marketplace. And that's really behind most of the strategies that we can see. So just briefly how Adelan is operating. So if people are interested in discussing hydrogen and fuel cells, we're very open to having a discussion. We really synchronize supply and demand of hydrogen technologies across the markets. We focus on technology, but we really want to solve customers' problems. That, that's what we, we try to work through with the customer. And that includes vehicles. So we, we do product reviews and um, look at designing fuel cell trials, look at competitor costs and benefits, and look normally compared with diesel. So that's in terms of fuel, CO2 costs and health and safety. We look at suitable installations, benefits validation and advocacy. So it's important to have all of those roles in um, a, a voice into government, but also internationally. And the code standards and insurance and health and safety documentation is absolute must. But what's key for us is looking for rollout opportunities. The market analysis and knowledge that we have really allows us to understand which are the first the first opportunities and develop exploitation plans with customers. Because fuel cells are confus confusing for most people, people have a limited awareness, um, but they come in different flavors. So there are solid oxide fuel cells and PEM technologies and AF, um, um, alkaline fuel cells. So there are different ways that people can confuse you. So what we like to do is demystify fuel cells by simply saying you take a green fuel and a fuel cell and it's a chemical reaction so that you can avoid the thermal and mechanical losses that you normally would experience using a mechanical process. So, as I said, green gas technology, and in our applications, we're normally recharging a battery. So that may be on a vehicle, that may be in a stationary application, it may be in a portable application. Essentially, we're just powering that, that battery, but we also produce some heat so that can be used for heating, space heating, water heating, but also for cooling down for refrigeration. So it's important to understand that fuel cells come in these different flavors. They have different benefits and it's important then to match those benefits with the application. Today, the UK hydrogen market is small, and um, but it's growing. You can look at this slide um, at another time in more detail. But today the hydrogen economy 
is moving. Uh, the Midlands has particular strengths and we're really interested in working in the transport side. We've got some great opportunities to work with businesses like Wave Industries in the Midlands uh, to develop um, heavy goods vehicle, uh, vehicles with an electrified platform. Um, Wave Industries already makes um, electrified uh, vehicles. 